Hello, my friends, and welcome back to another Our Turtle House Digital Fireside. My name is Mark Williams. I am your host. It is so good to be back with you for another wonderful fireside. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday evening with us. We've got some fantastic speakers I'll introduce in just a few minutes. But before we get to that, in case you haven't yet, go to turtle.link slash app and download the Our Turtle House app. It's a wonderful place with tons of resources from some of your favorite Latter-day Saint speakers like John, by the way, Hank Smith, Carmen Herbert, Meg Johnson, myself, and so many more. So go check that out at turtle.link slash app. And you also can go get tickets for our Laughing All the Way conferences at rturtlehouse.com slash events. We've got so many this year, seven different events in Woods Cross, Cedar City, Twin Falls, Boise, Idaho Falls, Ogden and Provo. There's so many. So we'd hope to see you live at one of our upcoming events later this year in, in December. It's going to be it's going to be fun. You're going to laugh. You're going to cry, mostly crying because you're laughing so hard, hopefully. <laughs> but it's going to be a lot of fun. So hope to see you there. And with that, let's go ahead and introduce our speakers tonight. Tonight's fireside is all about hope. And how do we find hope, especially when there's so much turmoil in the world and things that go wrong, especially the things that go wrong that we weren't expecting to go wrong? And then part of that's just life. But, you know, is it possible to experience hope when you're when you're experience when you're experiencing, you know, setbacks or you feel like you're in a fog or a mist of darkness or 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 whatever the situation is? How do we find more hope in our life? I'm so excited to introduce our speakers who will help us find more perspective on that. We'll start with our first speaker who feels that hope is everything. And once it's ignited, that feeling can change it all. She loves to guide others to flip the switch in their own lives and activate the light and potential within. She's been married for almost 23 years to her best friend, and she's a mom of three kids. And she chooses to use her experiences and challenges to help other, others navigate their own. She loves to work with the youth of the church and has traveled to give girls camp firesides and has spoken to hundreds of men and women about the power of hope. Let's wel welcome Lindsay Broshinsky. Lindsay, so good to have you here with us. Hi, so good to be here. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's, so, it's good to have you here and we're excited to get to know you a little bit better and hear more about your experiences with hope and, uh, and learn from you. We'll introduce our next speaker as well. Our next speaker was born in Las Vegas, Nevada, and raised in St. George, Utah. She's the middle of five children and has been in recovery from addiction for nine and a half years. She spent those years helping those who are still struggling as well. She works as a senior account executive, executive for a software company in the addiction recovery space. And most importantly, is a mother to two beautiful children, Jane and Calvin. She loves running half marathons, riding bikes, and being outside in, Saint George, in the St. George sunshine. She started a podcast called Come Back, featuring stories of those who have come back to the church and has made it her mission to share her story and let others know that they can come back to the gospel after the struggles that they face, whatever struggles they face. Let's welcome Ashley Stone. Ashley, so good to have you here on the fireside as well and such Thank an you. inspiring story as well. We're, good, we're excited to, to hear more about uh, your experiences. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you so much for again for being with us. We'll introduce our final speaker who graduated with a bachelor's in English from Brigham Young University and was part of the sketch comedy improv troupe, The Garens, and co-founded the theater as improv troupe, The Thrillionaires, which performs original improvised plays and musicals in a variety of genres. She's been featured in a variety of commercials, including The Real Mom in the viral videos for chat books and works as a freelance writer for commercials, web series, and scripts. scripts. She wrote the book, Real Moms Making It Up As We Go, she hosted the Feel Good Service Show, Random Max, and headlined the musical improv TV show, Show Offs, for three seasons on BYU TV. She starred in movies like Stalking Santa and was a script consultant, producer, and starred as Carrie Carrington in the film Once I Was a Beehive and Once I Was Engaged. She currently hosts the weekly podcast, The Lisa Show, which you can get at thelisashowpodcast.com on BYU Radio. And she and her late husband, Christopher have five children. Let's welcome Lisa Valentine Clark. Lisa, so good to have you here on the fireside with us as well. Thanks for having me. This is gonna be this is gonna be so much fun. I'm so excited to learn to to chat and learn with all of you about hope. So let's go ahead and get things started off the right way with an opening prayer by Lisa. Okay. 
our kind Heavenly Father. We're grateful for the opportunity that we have to be together through technology, and we're grateful for um, the messages that have been prepared. We ask you to please enlighten us and help us to learn things that are needed for us individually and our families, and to retain that knowledge. Help us to be able to feel thy spirit um, as we study and as we learn together, and we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you so much, Lisa. Okay. We'll have uh, Lisa and Ashley go backstage for a few minutes and I get to hang out with Lindsay. Lindsay, it's so good to have you here. And just a quick little question for you. How, how do you live? I understand that you, <laughs> that what a oh, way no. to start. How do you live, Lindsay? No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I think pretty, pretty, pretty well. <laughs> that's good. That's good. No, I, just I can appreciate I hear I hear that you that your phone is at one percent more often than it is not at one percent. And so how how does that work? Is are you just hoping like <laughs> how do you hoping, live? <laughs> I'm hoping that I'll be all right wherever I go and be able to take the calls. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I, I feel you there. I feel like I'm always, I'm always running on low power mode. So <laughs> I yeah. can save that extra little bit of juice. So <laughs> yeah, I've, I've, things are plugged in right now. We should be good to go. You and me both. You and me both. I love it. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much again for being here on the fireside with us. And we're so excited to hear more about your story and your thoughts about hope. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel so lucky and blessed and honored to be here. Um, something a little bit about me. Uh, my mom is an avid stargazer. And so it wouldn't be abnormal throughout my life to find us on rafts in our pool while she pointed out all the constellations or wake us up in the dead middle of the night to drive us somewhere in the deep Texas woods because she heard Haley's comment was coming by. Um, for as long as I can remember on her bucket list, it was to see the Northern Lights. And I can't even tell you the amount of times throughout my life I've got a text message or a YouTube video sent to me with this simple phrase, I need to see these exclamation mark. And so two kind of, I don't know if they're weird things about me, but Two things that I do pretty regularly. I don't know if anyone else does them. I check the Disney wait times for the rides. I think every day. I don't know why. I feel like I'm missing out of something. And I also check travel flights to go somewhere because I love traveling. And this particular day in 2019, it came in super handy because I found a screaming deal to go to Norway that would allow us to go at a time of year when I knew that we could see these Northern Lights. So when you find these screaming deals, you have to jump on that really quick. And so I talked to my husband, he was on board and we decided to call my mom and see if she would be on board. And I don't even think I got the sentence out or if I did, it was two seconds later. She just said, yes. And um, that's my mom in a nutshell. She's the fun bus. And so, uh, off we went to Norway, like I want to say six weeks later. And, um, we booked these two tours for our first couple of nights. We were going to have three nights up in the northernmost part. And so we decided we would try two nights to see the Northern Lights. And these tours we booked were kind of plushy. Um, they supplied us with these super warm suits and, um, they, <laughs> they gave us hot soup and they made us hot cocoa and all this yummy stuff. And um, it was really, really fun. <laughs> but the first night we really didn't see any lights and we got back around three or four in the morning and uh, we actually slept through the only amount of daylight that was available that day. And so the next night we went back out again and we had a ton of fun. We met friends from all over the world. I think at one time, my mom, actually, we got so bored standing there for hours that we started teaching each other songs. And my mom put her headlamp on like Rudolph and we taught them Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I don't know. But we were having a ton of fun making friends, but we did not see any lights. And um, 
they kept showing us through their camera, like, no, they're there. The lights are there. Um, you just have to look through um, and see them. And I'm thinking in my head, oh my gosh, we've just traveled all the way across the world. And all these pictures we've seen are not actually real. Um, it's just because the camera picks it up. And uh, we went back that night and we, none of us really, I think, dared to say that we were disappointed it, but until the next morning at breakfast. And we started talking and we're like, we have to do one more tour. We've got to get out there one more time. But we're kind of running low on money because we did these plushier tours. And so we decided just to do a big bus tour with a lot of people. And it was bumpier and crowded. And it's a little scarier to let someone take you out into the dark middle of nowhere, the literal definition of the middle of nowhere into Finland um, in the middle of the night. But I remember they opened the bus doors and all of a sudden we realized we had to trudge through snow that was up to our knees and go into this clearing with my mom that's in her mid seventies. Um, there was no chairs. There was um, this tiny fire um, that they built that all 40 of us rotated around to keep warm. And we were there for hours and they're telling us they're coming. We're not moving. We're going to stay here. And so we're like, okay. And um, you know what they did? They came and all of a sudden the sky opened and these lights were just dancing over our head in all of these different colors in green and whites and purples and they were swirling. And as we looked up at the sky, I just felt tears falling down my face and I'll never forget looking at my mom because she was truly in awe and the wonder on her face. And I was just so excited for her. And it's a memory I'll have in my heart forever. Um, and so I read this quote once and I don't remember where I read it, but it said, hope itself is like a star not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity and can only be discovered in the night of, ad of adversity. Hope can be like a star and often we can only see its light when we're suffering. And I've spent the last decade or so really diving into what I didn't really understand at the time was the word hope. Um, I love hope and I think it's everything, but I also think it gets a bad rap sometimes as being wishful thinking or a fluffy word. But when you've lost it, and I mean like face down on the mat, felt it leave, its return is one of the absolute greatest gifts we can be given in this lifetime. And how amazing is it that the very same God who formed the stars gave his only begotten son that will hold our hands, even in the dark of what can feel like forever. Um, I started battling some pretty irritating uh, health issues in high school, and um, I still battle them today. It's kind of uh, waxes and wanes. I battle a couple of different autoimmune diseases, and some days are good, and some days, well, they're just not. Um, but also in um, my senior year, I'm one of five girls and I'm the youngest. So I was the last one left at home. And it was in the fall of my senior year that um, my parents called me in and we just started talking and chatting. And then they, they informed me that they had made the decision to no longer go to church. And um, I don't really remember what was said after that. It just kind of felt like the lights turned off. Um, I grew up in a very active home. We went every single Sunday. And so for me, this just felt really shocking and rattled me to my core. And I just kind of felt those lights go off again. And um, days and weeks went on. And, and I remember sitting in seminary with my amazing fifth hour teacher, Brother Wilson. I feel like I could talk about him forever. But I'll just say, I don't really remember actually what he said or what the lesson was, but I did feel what sort of felt like a jolt and a spark back into my mind and into my heart is the words of my patriarchal blessing sort of just came to my remembrance. And I realized, oh my gosh, like I have my own journey. I have my own things to do here and I can choose and I could feel this warmth and I could see a broader picture and it was just an overall really powerful moment for me. Um, hope is like that. It's that larger lens and it's a wider view of something that I think once felt pretty locked um, with our gaze. It just, it, it gets to where 
we can see the bigger picture. And I didn't know that, but I really now know that a flash of hope or that single flicker of light, it can carry us for years. And I wish I had it locked and loaded in that moment and like cemented my testimony right then and there, but it didn't work that way at all, actually. And I had some really tough years and um, I made some pretty big mistakes um, as I tried to figure out who I was. And sometimes I would go to church, but there were full summers that I was living on the East Coast as a nanny. I didn't go at all. And, you know, it just kind of got to that point where everything I thought was going to make me happy really wasn't. And the things I thought I needed weren't really lining up. And I just sort of got really lost and I wasn't feeling peaceful. And I remember kind of just missing that tangible peace in my life. And there was one day in my... um apartment, I walked by the bathroom mirror and I just kind of caught my own reflection. And as I looked at myself, I suddenly could remember that last time I felt really, really clear. And I went back to that thread of hope from that day in seminary. And there's really so much power in those moments and in our minds, if only, you know, we can remember. And I decided just to step back into church um, with better intent and pray and read my scriptures to start. There was a significant day in college where I rode my bike up to the St. George Temple and I just sat there on the bench and uh, what happened was really sacred to me, but I had a really <laughs> pleading prayer and begging uh, really to feel that hope back in my life. And um, I was able to get a lot of clarity and uh, it really cemented my foundation for what which then I could build on that. And, and then, and now it's more about what I, you know, because faith sort of comes after hope. And so it's just the faith that Heavenly Father would deliver his promises and, and he really has. And so I was thinking about the road to Hana. I don't know if anybody has ever been on the road to Hana, but uh, it's in Maui and, you know, you're behind your steering wheel. And I, I have a picture to show kind of what it looks like when you're behind the steering wheel because it's sort of like you think you're going to die because you can't see around these blind corners. I I remember talking to my husband about driver's ed, like 10 and 2, 10 and 2, we're going off the cliff. I was convinced. And um, then we played too long at the stops and it was pouring rain and we started to come back in the dark. And I was seriously scared. And uh, my husband's knuckles were literally white. And sometimes I think life is like this. It's like we can't see ahead. The uncertainty is there and it's making us sweat buckets. And we even feel like um, a crash is imminent. But if we had the view of our father in heaven and we only had that aerial view of of the large, larger picture and that perspective. And I have a picture of that, of the road of Hana. Um, we would see that we aren't actually going to go over the cliff. It's really beautiful. Um, we would be able to see the stops along the way with clarity and even how to get back on that road. Um, that's hope. Hope is perspective and a gift from Heavenly Father to get a glimpse that he knows and he sees what is um, best for our lives. And sometimes it's seriously dark. I just want to talk about that. Because a few months ago, I was really, really struggling. And please tell me I'm not the only mom that locks themselves in the closet or lingers in a car just to get away. Um, <laughs> this particular day was one of the worst I remember experiencing in a long time. My son struggles with his mental health. And this last year has been particularly hard for him, as I think it has been for a lot of the world. And... Um, you know, with so much uncertainty and, and what's gone on these last few years, people that have struggled with their mental health, it's really had an uptick in symptoms. And even those who have never struggled with their mental health, they're finding themselves struggling maybe for the first time. And so this particular day, um, it was rough for him. And I want you to know if you're in this boat, please know that you're incredibly strong and um, please keep fighting reach out for help from professionals if you need it. And um, you are not alone. That I promise you. 
And uh, that night, I kind of felt like my hands were tied because he's living across the ocean in Hawaii, um, attending BYU over there, and everything felt hopeless to me. And I was overcome with like all of these fears and what ifs, and I just wanted to fix it. And I found myself hunched over, crying my eyes out in a dark closet where nobody could find me. And so metaphorically, I know this to be one of the adversary's greatest tactics. He likes to back us up into that cage and just swiftly shut the gate so that we feel completely and utterly alone. And and it's in this state that it's common to feel like nobody understands or they never will. And he wants us to have those feelings to be the opposite of truth and light. And as I was laying on the ground in a pile of laundry, reviewing how sad and terrible and scared and everything that I was, um, I quietly felt the calming words come to my mind. Lindsay, just get up, stand up, open the door, go out to where it's light. And I did. And as I emerged, um, I found a quiet house with everybody asleep. I don't know how many hours had gone on, but I walked to the front window of his bedroom and I just started to look out the blinds and I prayed for what felt like literally forever. And um, the wind started to blow and we were having a storm and then it started to rain. And I uh, felt this calming words again. And I like the wind, I can blow it all away. Fear is not of me, I am peace. And some of these words suddenly brought back to my remembrance a poem that this same son wrote um, when he was struggling one day, his senior year in high school. And I just kind of want to finish with that and read that quickly, but it's called In the Glass. And it says, I sit alone in humble admiration of him who died. How perfect was the debt. His face is dark. I try, but do not see him. No matter what I do, his hand will ne'er meet mine. I bow my head in prayer and supplication. His hand is firm, my shoulders grasp. To me, he says, arise and face the challenge. Do not forget that I am in the glass. To you, it may be darkened by the ash of worldly praise, but I, like the wind, will blow it all away. For I am your brother, see it as it be. You cannot touch me, my eyes you cannot see. Have you forgotten? Arise, dust off your robes. Remember who you were in your heavenly abode. For I shall teach you the things from right to wrong. Follow me and we shall sing our humble song. As I circled back to the words of this poem, I felt like what felt like a hug to my body and clear, concise words to my mind. I've got him and I've got you. Lean into Christ who knows this struggle. And I could see that bigger picture. And I had this thought recently that we need to become hunters of peace because where there's peace, we find Jesus Christ. And where we find Jesus Christ, we find perspective. And where there's perspective, there is hope. And um, as we come to know him, we'll come to know ourselves. And as we go towards his light, we can truly receive all that he has to offer. We can literally pick up that grace and that comfort and that love. And so um, I love to imagine hope lights illuminating one by one all over the world um, as we're willing to share kind of how we stood back up with one another because there's so much power and hope can be ignited by people just simply coming together like we are tonight and sharing their stories. Um, I love the visual of the person who crosses that tumultuous mountain hill and just reaches back and brings the next person through because hardships and challenges provide empathy. And Jesus Christ is the greatest teacher of empathy that we have. And Um, So it makes sense that we would need to learn empathy to be more like him. And since he can't be here right now today and walking in our homes, I, I love to think that he uses us to be his hands, to help lift those around us and to help provide the peace that he can give the perspective and ultimately the hope. And um, sometimes, you know, when it feels like we're down on that mat in our face for too long, If we were in a real match, maybe they would slam the mat and we'd be the clear loser. But just know that Heavenly Father doesn't work that way. Um, He works in his perfect ways and in his perfect timing. And 
um, he gives us time and he'll work with us and he'll teach us and he'll show us and he'll guide us to his only begotten son because he knows that that is where we can find um, that comfort and deliverance from the things that are just really, really hard sometimes. And so it's my testimony that um, we're not always going to be the giver and we're not always going to be the receiver and we can't really... Um, stay clear of either side. There'll be times when we'll find ourselves graciously sharing hope, but there's going to be other times when we're going to humbly need to receive it. And I know that hope is everything. And um, I know that Jesus Christ lives and he has uh, given us his light to hold on to. And the Heavenly Father knows you by name, and I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lindsay, I loved your thoughts there, and the visual that you shared of the road to Hana. It, I thought, that's such a powerful visual, especially when you're when we're going through life and the twists and turns. And the thought that come, comes came to mind when you were describing how you can't see ahead that with all those twists and turns, sometimes it's easy to get just like even car sick. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're, you're, you're sick, physically sick of all the, the twists and turns. And, and you, uh, I, I think of the one time I was on the road to Hana and we, we gave up halfway through mm -hmm. because it, you know, so I never got to the black sand beach. I never got to see the, the reward at the end of all the twists and turns, but, uh, because we were just we were sick of of the of the drive and and it in terms of of what you shared i think that that like sometimes when you're in those moments that you uh, you want to give up you feel, don't, you're not feeling the hope like what like what you shared that it's those times where where you just got to keep you just got to keep going so because there's there's that end that goal that that uh, the the black sand beach and <laughs> all the beautiful things that are, that uh, Heavenly Father has waiting for us if we just keep keep going. Thank you so much. That was so powerful. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing that. I love that perspective. Well, and I love that you said hope is a perspective. I thought that yeah. that was just right on the money. I just thought a lot of times we think that something, you know, we're trying to think, how do I create hope? How do I manufacture it? How do I grow it? How do, you know, like, is it like a tangible object or something? But I love how you totally set up everything to say that it's a perspective of, and so then that makes it easier to choose. And it's a doable action. I love that. Thank you. I love that. Cool. Sweet. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much again for being here on the fireside and for sharing your thoughts and your perspective and your testimony on, on how we can increase the hope in our lives. Thank you so much again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You bet. We'll move to our next speaker of the evening, Ashley. So good to have you here with us here on the fireside. And I'm so excited to get to, to know you a little bit better. You, uh, you, you're you living in St. George now, is that correct? No, I'm from St. George. Oh, you're from St. George. I live, yeah, I live in Bountiful. Um, oh, okay, cool. Yeah, so, Sweet. but I am from St. George. That's where awesome. I up and and so, so St. George is home. I, I, every time I drive through St. George, going to Vegas or, you know, down to visit some friends down there, I just... I, I love it down there. It's just the, I, I assume that uh, it holds a special place in your heart from, from where you grew up, right? Yeah, it does. And my parents still live there and my siblings live there. And so it's our getaway place. And I love uh, it. yeah, so we love it. I love it. I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot a little bit, but what's your, what's one of your favorite things? Uh, maybe a, maybe a hidden gem about St. George that most people who aren't from there don't realize or know about or yeah. Well, I'll tell you what my favorite thing is. There is a trail that goes from like Diamond Valley um, down to like it's on the side of the road. If you if you're driving to Diamond Valley or Winchester Hills, you'll see this paved trail 
And it is my favorite place to run. It's exactly seven miles from Chuckawalla to um, the top of Snow Canyon. And I, it's just this peaceful, beautiful run. And I, I love it. So if you have like e-bikes or if you're a runner, um, I 10 out of 10 recommend that trail. It's awesome. That sounds amazing. Okay. I'm definitely going to have to go check that out next time I'm down there. That sounds yeah, so good. I, I've probably ran that trail probably 75 times. <laughs> so. Oh, that's perfect. Well, and then you know that it's good. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Well, Ashley, thank you so much again for being here with us. I'm so excited to hear more about your story and your perspective on on increasing the hope or experiencing more hope in our life. So go ahead and take it away, my friend. Awesome. Okay, so I um, I have kind of a crazy story, and um, my perspective on hope has really been it's been shaped by an experience that I had. when I was younger, I was active in the church as a kid. My family, I was raised in the church. Um, you know, I was a, a good kid. Like my, uh, I never got in trouble. Like elementary school, I got in trouble one time and it was for balancing something on my head. And it's like scarred me for life because I was just such a good kid. I never, I never got in trouble or anything. And um And then as time went on, I went into middle school and I started to feel just really insecure, all the things that middle schoolers feel. Um, And I started to hang out with some friends that were doing, you know, things that were kind of against my standards. Um, But I was in a place where I didn't really, I hadn't really made the choice um, beforehand to stay away from this stuff. Like I, I had been taught in church and by my parents, but it just, um, I was kind of just really vulnerable at the time. And so, um, I was in summer after eighth grade, I was hanging out at my friend's house and, um, one of the cool kids from the basketball team at the high school was, um, they were smoking marijuana and I decided to give it a try. And so, after that, it was just kind of a, a can of worms. I um, tried alcohol for the first time. And it was like, I had this feeling of confidence for the first time in my life. And I um, got, I started chasing after that, that high from alcohol and from um, drugs. And it just, it kept escalating. And I started to get involved in other things. Um, you know, I was dating older guys and going to parties. And I was just a kid, like I was in ninth grade. And, um, and then, you know, it just kind of progressed. And uh, I was, it was my junior year of high school, and I was going to the alternative school in St. George. And I, my parents sent me to an adolescent facility, I was 16. And um, it was a lockdown facility in southern Utah. And I was there for 15 months. And I felt like I had no idea what was going on. It was like pretty much kid jail, I guess you could say. And um, yeah, I was at that program and it, it was, I think it was overall a good experience for me. I think it kept me safe and um, it was scary, but I, I got through it. And, um, and then I graduated from that program and I, I just didn't really do the healing inside that I needed to do. And I was still really young and just, to be frank, kind of stupid. <laughs> and I, I got out of that program and I um, just got back right with my old friends and I started doing heroin and I started doing just harder drugs and it, I just had a bad day one time and I think I like broke up with my boyfriend and, um, I just decided to do it. I, I just like, I was missing that like inner compass that told me, wow, this is a really bad idea. I just, I, I don't know. Like I just, I, I just tried it and then I tried it and then it took about three times of doing it. And then I was hooked. Like I couldn't, I was sick if I didn't have it. And it, it really took me down a, really dark hole. And I was in and out of jail, in and out of rehab. I was um, really, really struggling and in a dark place. And um, 
it was, it was really hard. I ended up in Arizona. I was living in a drug house, um, pretty much as dark of place as you can get. And, um, I, during all of this time, my dad was somebody that was a really big support for me. So keep in mind, my brother was on a mission during this time. My, my dad and my mom were going to church, very, you know, righteous church members, and they just didn't really know what to do with me. I was, they, they were kind of planning on me dying, to be honest. And, um, and I thought I was going to die. I couldn't see how I could make it out. Like I was in this really dark, scary place. And, um, and so, but my dad, he never gave up on me. I think my mom, she had other little kids at home and she kind of had to <clears throat> just kind of lock her heart. Um, she had to like, I was just causing so much pain for the family that she kind of had to separate herself from me, which I, don't blame her. I was causing a lot of pain to everybody and um, my dad, but he would, he would try to rescue me and um, he wouldn't enable me in ways of like giving me money or, you know, things like that. But he, um, he would take me to treatment if I said I was ready to go. And, and we did that several times where he'd come pick me up and take me to treatment. And it was just kind of this um, really just hard, scary, dark time in my life. And, um, uh, finally my dad, he came to Arizona, he picked me up and he said, Ashley, if I take you to treatment, are you going to stay and complete the program or are you going to run away? And it was in that moment that I just felt like, like I couldn't do it anymore. Like I was so just sick and tired of being sick and tired and I put my seatbelt on and I was like, hey, dad, let's go. So we drive to Arizona and it was this really just really hard thing that we did. And um, he dropped me off at a, a, a cold turkey detox in Fresno, California. And I was there for 10 days and I was cold turkey detoxing off heroin and Xanax and pretty much everything under the sun. I, I had no, nothing that prevented me from doing things. Like I was just a mess. And, um, so anyway, it, it was really just a really challenging time. And, um, I went through that detox and then my dad came and picked me up and he took me to the Salvation Army and I was at the Salvation Army for six months. And when I first got to the program, I kind of felt like, you know, I don't know if I can do this. This is so hard. Um, I just didn't feel, I didn't know if I had it in me to complete the program. And the preacher, he brings me, because the Salvation Army is a, a Christian-based program, and he brings me into his office, and he's like, okay, Ashley, choose a Bible to use while you're here. So I pick the pink Bible on the shelf, and I open up this Bible, and there's a Book of Mormon bookmark in the Bible. And I was just like, what? Are you serious? Like, I was the only person with a history of you know, a background of the church and, um, in the whole program. And it was, it was, I took that as a little tender mercy from God that I was in the right place and that I was doing what he wanted me to do. And towards the end of the program, I received an email from a friend. Um, and it said, Ashley, if you read the book of Mormon every single day, I promise you will never go back to your old ways. And so I, read the book of Mormon every single day. And my life, um, you know, it took some time and I was like, I, I just don't know if I have it in me to never drink alcohol again, or, um, you know, I don't know if I can stay on this path and be happy. Um, and I got out of Salvation Army and I went home to St. George and I made this goal to get a temple recommend, a limited use rec recommend to do baptisms for the dead with my singles ward. And I went through the repentance process with my bishop. I um, quit drinking coffee. I quit smoking cigarettes, which was really hard. Um, I quit chewing the Nicorette gum that I used to quit smoking. And um, the only way that I can describe that is like the Savior's enabling power of the atonement. Um, you know, quitting drugs is one thing because it's destroying your life, but quitting these little things that are they're not necessarily like ruining your life, like 
right away. It's, it's really hard to give those things up when they're so habitual. And it was a miracle that I was able to quit all of those things. And I went to the temple and I was kind of like, you know, this, I feel more peace than I did before. And so I just kept going with it. And I, I experienced a true change of heart. And um, in the Book of Mormon, um, Alma the Younger, I can relate to his story so much because when I'm sharing this story with you, it's like I can't even relate to this person that I was when I was going through this stuff because um, I've truly experienced a change of heart. And, um, and going back to church is what saved my life. And the Savior's atoning sacrifice saved my life. And I, I feel like it's such a miracle um, you know, I, I ended up meeting my husband who has a very similar story to me. Um, we actually met at a church 12 step meeting when I was 18 and we didn't, um, connect until like reconnect until five years later. And, um, it was just really orchestrated by God and, um, just a really awesome miracle. And I feel like, you know, all of those things that I went through have given me this experience that I've been able to share with other people about the miracles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, so, you know, time goes on. I've got two kids. We got married in the Bountiful Temple and life's pretty good. Um, and then a couple months ago, I, I started to see a lot of people that I know and um, just a lot of voices on social media sharing, um, you know, things they don't like about the church or whatever. And um, so I decided to start my podcast, which is called the Comeback Podcast. And um, I've had this opportunity to share stories of those who have come back to the church and the miracles that have happened in their life because of the church. And um, it's been such an incredible experience. And, you know, this fireside kind of our topic is hope. And um, I think in my experience, God is the source of true hope. And um, I think that Lindsay, when she was sharing about, you know, being at the bottom and your face is against the mat and you're in darkness and, um, I went through that and I, you know, the only thing that I had at the time was relying on my heavenly father to give me some kind of peace and hope that I would make it through that. And, um, you know, I trusted that I trusted, you know, if I, if I experiment on this and see what happens, if I, if I get my temple recommend and go back to church, like, you know, I'm going to see what happens if I do this, I'm going to trust him. And, um, and my life has completely transformed and changed. And I'm so incredibly grateful for the Savior and his atoning sacrifice so that I can have the amazing life that I have today. And I know that it's all because of him. And I, um, you know, based on my past, I it's nothing short of a miracle. I don't know if I deserve everything that I have. I, um, I'm so grateful. And I'm just so grateful that, um, you know, I had my heavenly father to help me through that really dark time in my life. And I'm grateful for his forgiveness. And, um, I think that we, um, there's always hope. Um, it doesn't matter how dark your situation or how scary it is. There's always hope. So, um, I, I'm so grateful to be here and share my story with all of you. And I say these things in the name of my son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Ashley, yeah. that was so powerful. Thank you so much for sharing your, your such a personal, such personal experiences, you know, that you've gone through throughout your life. A question that I wanted to ask you, and you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but, but uh, knowing what you know now and uh, through, through the transformation that you you've had and the experiences that you've had in, in coming back and, and, or whether it's from reading from the book of Mormon or, or whatever, the, the, whatever, it is that's that uh, has gotten you to this point. Knowing what you know now, if if you were talking to younger Ashley or somebody who just is struggling and feeling like there's no hope, and they're just not sure where to even start, you know what what advice would you give to them 
to help them find the hope that they feel like they're lacking? Well, I, it's a great question. I think that um, experimenting and seeing if the savior's atoning sacrifice is really for you. Because if you just, I think for me, it was like this, it was too hard. Like this was my whole life. My whole, every single day was devoted to finding drugs, getting money for drugs. That was my whole life. And um, I was like, how can I change so much? Like I, I had nothing, like I was, I had nothing. And um, I just, you know, but I decided to experiment and just see, I was like, I'm going to do everything they say to do. You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's going to work for me. I don't know if it's going to change my heart. I don't know if that's even possible. And, but I just decided like, I'm just going to give it a try and experiment. And I, I didn't leave any boxes unchecked. Like I, I went all in, I was like, I'm going to give this, you know, a couple months, I'm going to get my limited use temple recommend. And I'm just going to um, see what happens. And, you know, I, I did everything my Bishop asked me to do. And the change of heart I experienced was so dramatic that, and it wasn't like a overnight thing. Like it was over, you know, it took some time, but, um, like I look at my life today and then I look at my life 10 years ago and there's just no denying the power of God. And so my advice would be experiment and, you know, do what it takes and, and God will pull through and he will show up for you. I love that. That's, I think that's, that's so powerful. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Wow. It's a powerful story. Thank you. And Ashley, I love what you said about, I can't imagine um, how dark some of those days were. And I just think you're incredibly brave and vulnerable to share that story. And it's just a testament that I, I know that through our pain and through the darkest moments that the Heavenly Father can turn that and repurpose it into tangible hope for other people. And that's what you are doing. And I just, I just know you're blessing so many lives. Um, and I love that you have that also the comeback. Uh, is it a podcast? Did you say? Yeah, it, it's a podcast. Yeah. And it's just, yeah, I've always wished that existed because I would always say, you know, for all these stories that are one way, I want to hear the miracles. I want to hear what's yep. out there with all these things that are inexplainable. And so right. I love yeah. that you have that. I can't wait to check it out. Thank you so it. much. Well, Ashley, thank you so much again for sharing such a powerful witness and, and your testimony about, about hope and how we can experiment upon the words of God and, and find the hope that we might be feeling is, has been lost. So thank you so much. We'll move to our final speaker of the evening. Lisa, so good to have you back. It's been a, it's been a hot second, couple yeah. of, couple of years almost, I guess, since, yeah. uh, since you're on the, the fireside and just, just uh, always love being with you and and learning from you and and uh, I I have to say just as a side note when the chat books commercial came out the first chat books I I sent that around to all my friends I just it was like this lady is so funny I love it <laughs> thank you <laughs> so, it's so fun to do I can only imagine I can only imagine so love it well Lisa thank you so much again for being with us go ahead and take it away my friend you bet. Okay. So I, uh, you know, first take some things like very literally. So I thought I would take hope very literally. And I want to start off with a poem that I love that um, is quoted in our home a lot. I, I think about it all the time and we do it. Um, it's by Emily Dickinson and it's called Hope is the Thing with Feathers. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. And sweetest in the gale is heard, and sore must be the storm that could abash the little bird that kept so many warm. I've heard it in the chilliest land and on the strangest sea, yet never in extremity it asked a crumb of me. I love the theme of that poem so much that hope 
resides in all of us. It can really reside in the hearts of the good. And it really can liberate us from despair and gives us strength to move forward. It empowers us. And then it never asks anything of us. And I really, really love that. Um, There's a lot of definitions of hope. And the one that has been most meaningful to me has been the secondary meaning of hope. So the first meaning of hope is, I think, how we use it just in common language. You know, it's just a feeling, an expectation, a desire that something's going to happen. What, you know, I hope I get into college. I hope I get that part. I hope you recover well from your surgery. Whatever it is, we have this expectation and that's where our hope lies. But the secondary meaning of the word hope is a feeling of trust. And it's kind of an archaic um, meaning, but I like it more. (laughs) And I'll tell you why. Um, We all want certain things to happen and we all have certain expectations. Uh, I we're even commanded to have righteous desires, right? Like it's not even a bad thing. Um, you know, we're told to like keep our, you know, expectations, you know, down and, and don't have very many expectations because that'll be like the way to heartache or whatever. But um, it's a righteous thing to to work for and want and hope for good things for ourselves. And, and that desire, that yearning or longing or pipe dream or whatever is part of the human experience. But what if those things that you hope for don't happen? then what? Or what if uh, hope was just a feeling of trust? And so then this is the sad part of my um, fireside message. When I tell you what, uh, how I know how it feels to lose all hope. Um, I had no hope. I, I, I felt like it was all gone after my husband died and all the realities of life sort of set in that I had lost not only my best friend, but the father of my children and my biggest cheerleader and my confidant and husband and all the things in one person. And I just thought, well, what's the point even to hope or dream in the future if everything that I hope for is something that I already had and I know for certainty I won't have again right now. I had righteous good desires. I went and planned for them. And and even more than that, I sacrificed for these hopes and these dreams, sweat and tears and blood for the, for these hopes and dreams. It was not hypothetical. It, for me, it was real, real work. And I sacrificed for them and I didn't get what I wanted. Um, and I was devastated when my husband died. I still am. But every, um, one, I think it's really interesting because when we're trying to like connect and think about, you know, what this feels like to sort of lose hope, which I think is a great way to to find out how you create it. Everyone assumes that the worst day of my life was when Topher was, my my late husband's name is Christopher, we call him Topher, learned that he had ALS, but they're wrong. The, um, it actually is sort of like a, a mix of a lot of different days. Um, the worst day of my life was when Topher stopped talking uh, when people at, talk about the tragedy, they talk um, like if something horrible comes and happens, they think they talk of it in a singular event, like when he was diagnosed or when he died. But really, I don't think that that's how hope and faith and love is eroded. It's a thousand lost hopes and dreams and tragedies, you know, sort of death by a thousand paper cuts. Part of my grief is learning just to sort of pace everything, right? Like expectations, energy, hope, because nothing lasts long, good or bad. And living with ALS was particularly cruel because um, it had no reliable progression or rate, but it always has the same devastating result. A hundred percent of people who have ALS will die of ALS. It's just a matter of time. For most life expectancy is two to five years with a small percentage living past that. And so at the beginning, we searched for clues or any indication of hope. We would soothe ourselves like with sort of this anecdotal evidence of of people that like, oh, this is good. It started in his legs. So that means it'll be, it, it could mean that it's slower progression or we just look for hope anywhere, whether it was scientifically, um, reasonable or not. 
we could look on the positive side because we hadn't been proven wrong yet. So we adjusted. I remember when Christopher was first diagnosed, he, um, his legs were very weak. And so he used a cane and we were like, oh, a cane, we can buy all these cool canes. This will be awesome. Like we'll get really into canes. Um, and they make him look distinguished. They're kind of cool. They can go with his outfits. Like we, we had hope that this was going to be hard, but we could do it. But we, it didn't last long because after he started tripping and really, um, falling one too many times, it transitioned to a wheelchair. And that was a bigger pill to swallow. And it was harder and it made major life adjustments to the way that we lived. And it made me become particularly aware of the lack of handicapped accommodations in our country. Don't get me started. And, but then I thought, okay, we can do this. We can adjust our home and we can get a, a handicapped accessible van and we can, these are hard things. Um, we can get ramps and redo our house so that he can fit like this. We could live like this forever. As, still, as, as for, long as you can still talk or type on your computer or play the piano, like who cares? Big deal. You're just in a wheelchair and we could still have hope and we still managed it. We can live like this. And then there was the day where um, he rolled up to the piano and closed it and said, my piano playing days are over. And I was like, what? You can still play. What are you talking about? And his hands and his fingers progressed faster than his legs did. And he was fine with it. He thought, I'm just going to focus on all the things that I can still do. I can still teach. I can still direct. I can still be with my family and hang out like this is fine. But for me, it was the beginning of, oh, we're not in control of any of this. And I'm going to be constantly saying, oh, we can live like this. No, we can live like this until it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, for a long time, we were so young and still full of energy and hope. And that got us through a lot of hard times. We adjusted. Um, but that was a sobering thought because I knew I wasn't in control. Watching Christopher, the best person I knew, my favorite person, suffer slowly and lose the ability to move and to speak killed a lot of hopes and dreams one by one for the future. New ones, it seemed every day. And when he died, that's when I realized what that hope seemed to be gone. And so I lived in this really weird place for months knowing and feeling the blessings of God and seeing evidence of miracles and blessings, but not feeling hope in my heart for any kind of happy future. And I, I thought, and I even wrote like, I have no hope for the first time in my life. So something that I learned about hope, um, which seemed really depressing and desperate at the time, I guess it still does, is um, when I didn't have any hope, I thought, well, I'll just borrow some. And that's what I did. I said things like, I'll never be happy again. I'll never laugh. I don't dream. I don't know what to ask God for now. I just don't care. And my sister Gina and some good friends, Haley and Casey and Wendy, my brother Chris said, okay, okay. And they said, you'll be okay. You're going to be happy and laugh, but it's okay if you don't feel like that now. You're meant to feel happy and you will, but you'll probably always be sad too at the same time. They laughed and dreamed for me and they sat with me. And because I trusted them so much, I believed them and I was able to borrow hope from them. So the second meaning of hope is where it start of, of learning what it is to to trust in what that means started to grab hold. So I love the scripture in Proverbs that says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. For me, that became a formula for how I borrow trust and then take hold of it in the second meaning. So what does it really mean to trust someone? Um, well, I think we all have a um, person in our lives that we trust more than anything, that you can tell your secrets to, that you can um, rely on when you don't trust your own opinion. And you you go to them when you have a hard time. And what was hard for me is, is that I trusted Christopher more than anyone. Um, I also started thinking about what I do improvisational like theater. So I go on stage and nobody has a script. Nobody knows what it's going to be about or what characters or, and we create with the thrillionaires um, 
the uh, an entirely new play or musical or and song and we just make it all up and the reason why and people are always like how do you do that aren't you so nervous and it, it obviously we've worked on it for 20 years we've been doing this together but the reason why i don't get nervous when i go on stage anymore is because i trust who i perform with i know that they're going to set me up um to do the best job and I'm going to do the same thing for them and we're going to play and it's going to be fun. And that's the way, the reason why we're able to do, you know, show offs or, or, uh, and we did a TV show that was completely improvised or we do plays and musicals. It's because of the people you do it with. That's, you know, 90% of it. And then you add to it, you do yes. And so you have this, this, this agreement that no matter what someone says to you, you will affirm it and that you will add to it. So if someone comes on stage and says, hey, sister, um, it's mom and dad want us to go to the reunion. We got to leave right now. You don't say, I'm not your sister. What are you talking about? And stop all the action. What you do is you say, oh, OK, let me go grab my shoes and I'll be on my way. You're accepting the reality and what they've given to you. And I realized that I needed to accept my reality once Christopher had died and add to it and that the Lord expected me to add to it. And I could do that because the Lord had never left me, even when things got really, really hard near the end of Christopher's life and um, during a global pandemic while I'm trying to take care of him by myself and five kids and work full time. Like it was ridiculous, but I always felt the Lord was with me, even though it was excruciatingly difficult. So I knew that I could trust the Lord. And I'll, and I, I, I also knew that I could trust Christopher. And the way that he lived his life to the very last breath was that he trusted in the Lord and he wasn't afraid to die. He was just afraid to suffer. And he um, would trust that God had a good, righteous purpose for him and for his family. And he trusted that God would take care of us, especially when it got hard. And he did. And he trusted that God would, would uh, he would meet God and serve us from the other side. Um, and trust is a choice. I saw Chris choose it and it was really difficult. And I thought, I want to honor his life and his death in such an honorable way. So I'm going to choose trust too. So leaning on what we don't know is the second part of that scripture. And I learned that I had no idea that ALS and the crazy things that have happened to my family were happening. And I basically was like, oh, anything could happen, which means anything could happen. And so leaning to my own un understanding became like the voice of the spirit in my head saying, yeah, you might never laugh or be happy again, but you don't know. You didn't see this horrible thing coming. So some wonderful, cool thing could happen too. And you don't know. That's the whole point. You don't know. Don't lean to your own understanding. And that real life, like just can do sort of Midwestern spirit really came through there, you know, um, and it, if faith is not dictated, we all know by what we see, right? You can still have faith and believe in God in spite of what you do see. Um, there's so many examples of that in the scriptures, and we don't have time to go through all of them. But I will say that when I would look at the scriptures and when I look at people who'd gone through hard things, I thought, why did I think ever think anything good was going to happen? Like most of the examples in the scriptures are people overcoming horrible things that they don't see in front of them. They don't know what's going to happen next. So why do I think that I was going to be able to see ahead of me. Trusting God means that God will, doesn't mean that God is going to take away the hard. I kept thinking life's going to get a little bit easier now. And it never did. And so I was like, oh, but I feel like God's here, but why is it getting harder? Sometimes it means lighting, lightening your burden, uh, and not, but I'm not always. And that's a hard truth, but I chose to trust. It made it easier because Christopher had to, as well. And that's why I was having such a hard time because he wasn't there um, physically. Uh, I do feel like hope, what I've learned about hope as well, is that we don't believe in a transactional God. Um, the scriptures don't tell us that. Uh, we unknowingly, though, assume if we follow the commandments and if we are faithful, then we will prosper in the land, which means everything will be great eventually, right? Right. We have hope for positive outcomes. And, and I still think that we need to have, we are commanded to have a brightness of hope. So how do we still 
follow that commandment of having a brightness of hope when we know that it's not a transactional thing, that we can still go through hard times and good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. And what does it all mean? Well, we've been promised more than our hopes and our dreams. We've been promised all that the Father has, all of the blessings, especially important ones that we haven't even imagined that we want. Don't lean to your own understanding of what the best blessings are. Our God is a mysterious God. His ways are higher than our ways. And I have learned that it's okay if you don't see things that are coming, that that's what God has intended that his imagination and goodness and knowledge and loving of us is more than we can even imagine. So the fact that he's not giving us what we want right now in this moment doesn't mean that he doesn't have greater things in store. In fact, I know he has greater things in store. He's promised us that he does. It just means that our ability to imagine it is limited right now on earth. And I'll be honest, like, I don't, I don't want this outcome that I'm living with right now. Being a widow is just not really great. It's not as mysterious and glamorous as it, as it might seem. Um, Christopher didn't want to like slowly, I mean, he was this animated, could not sit still, crazy professor and theater director. He didn't want to be, and also claustrophobic, didn't want to be confined to a wheelchair and not be able to speak. Like we didn't want that. We didn't pray for it. We didn't desire it. We didn't go, this is so great. It's just teaching us the greatest things. We didn't, but we don't also like lean to our own understanding. And he had hope in the end. And there's something very, very significant about that. A huge part of he, who he was, was someone who trusted God. Acknowledging our Heavenly Father um, is doing just that. I'm trying to do that right now. I'm trying to write in my gratitude journal. I'm trying to do that because it creates more hope. Once um, last conference of April 22, uh, President Nelson asked us to seek and expect miracles. And I was like, I'm not falling for that again. I'm not seeking. And I thought, oh, why am I having this strong reaction to this prophet who just wants me to be happy? And I've since repented and I've studied miracles. And I actually went through the, uh, the last six months and wrote down all the miracles that I saw when, as soon as Chris was diagnosed to now, you know, two years after his death. And I was really humbled. There were many miracles, uh, some too sacred to talk about, some that I talk about quite frequently, but acknowledging the Lord is not just for his ego. It, it, it's, it's all and completely for us to feel his love and gratitude. It creates and generates and sparks hope in huge ways. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. Um, the Lord has more in store for us, better than we could ever plan for ourselves. And, and at, after all, we're the expert on ourselves, right? We know how we live and what we want, what we don't want. But like most people, uh, like myself, like Chris Clark, the evidence of the direction of our paths is rarely seen at the time and most often seen at the end of our lives, the end of our story looking back. So it doesn't mean it's not happening. And I'm grateful that I got to witness an extraordinary life in Christopher Clark. It taught me the value of trusting in the Lord at our most desperate and the peace and joy that we can have even amid pain and grief. And without it, our story is, is incomplete. So my hope is that everyone will create and generate hope, even in your darkest times by trusting in the Lord. That creates hope. No matter what happens and many wonderful and horrible things will, it's just the deal with life. If you do, it will all be okay. It'll be more than okay. It will be glorious beyond all comprehension. And that is our promise from a loving Heavenly Father. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lisa, that was fantastic. And I loved how you talked about sometimes we have to borrow hope from other people and that, you know, maybe it's, it's somebody that we trust or that knows us better than we may know ourselves. And, and part of that is, I love the, the, the experience that you shared with, that you learned from improv, the yes and, and that the whole point of that is to accept the reality that's given you. And I know, at least from my experience, that uh, as I go through challenging situations or, and, or whenever I feel like I'm struggling 
with hope and I'm looking for somebody to borrow some hope from that the more I come to accept the reality that I have instead of, instead of wishing that things would be different, that that's where I, that's when hope starts coming back for me. And so I loved, I've, I didn't even think about the, that being an improv thing, but you're like, it, that took me back to my high school days. I love it. Well, I'll tell you, you know, and grief is tricky and it's not toxic positivity that I'm talking about, you know, cause there's those days where you get in your bed and you pull the covers over and you go, yeah, I just, no, thank you. I'm out. <laughs> and I think that's totally appropriate, but it's, it's the stories and the internal deep stories that we tell ourselves. Yep. Like I'll never, totally. I'll always, um, and not being able to imagine. And that, you know, in, in my desperate pleas, I'm so glad that I had friends that said, oh, you know, I, I believe you and I, and they would cry with me, but you're so dumb. You will <laughs> laugh again. And, but I'll, but I'll believe that for you. Like, I don't want to, you know, right. and I'll hold that space for you. So. Well, and, and, and just in that same vein that you mentioned that they also said, and you know, you'll, you'll find happiness again, but you'll also probably still be sad. Yeah. You know, acknowledging it, it felt truthful and it felt um, important. Totally. I love and that. Thank hold you on so to much. that. Oh, big time. That was fantastic. Thank you so much. Thanks. One of the things that you said that I really loved was you said, you know, how do I know that something really awesome isn't going to happen? Because yeah. <laughs> this, we don't know, you know, I, I love that because I think a lot of times if something bad happens, it's like, well, what's next around the corner? What bad thing is going to happen next? And so to have that you know, outlook of, well, something really awesome could be around the corner. I loved that. That was perfectly. I do simple. feel like sometimes that gets me out of bed. I think, you know what, Lisa, your whole life changed in a day. Your whole life could change in a day again. Yeah. Like, I love that. I love that. Okay. I love that too. I'm going to be thinking about that for a while. And it um, me out of a deep depression, like that thought, sense. like, I don't know. Yeah. It's like the yeah. spirit was giving me some tough love. Like, you don't know. You're not that smart. <laughs> I feel like it needs to be on a sweatshirt somehow. Like, I know. You don't know. I was like, <laughs> What's gonna right. happen? I feel like I'm not smart. I feel like I should. You're okay. Yeah. I love what you said about um, trust is a choice. And as you watched your husband make that choice, and it just, I think that stuck out to me really a lot. Just thinking, okay, I'm going to trust like Topher. It kind of just went together. Like, that's like Topher. And I just thought that's just such a really cool thing that to remember that we can decide to pick that up and believe and to trust that he's going to come through with his promises and that clarity and maybe the surprises that we don't know um, either way. And I just love that. I'm going to be thinking about those two things for a while. So I was taking mad notes over here. So thank you for your wisdom today. I appreciate it. I stole it from Chris, but, but it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, Lisa, thank you so much again for being with us and for sharing such a, a powerful witness and and your your personal experiences of seeking for hope and and finding finding hope when you felt like it was lost. That was so powerful. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, this has been fantastic being with all three of you this evening and learning from each of you, just like Lindsay, I've been taking a ton of notes, just trying to, to keep up with all the things that I've learned from all three of you tonight. So thank you so much again for being with us. We'll finish with a closing prayer. And like we do most weeks, we'll hang out for a few extra minutes and get to know each other a little bit better, shoot the breeze. And so we'll go, we'll go from there. Let's have a closing prayer by, uh, by Lindsay. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to come together tonight to get to know one another and to hear each other's messages. And we feel so blessed to be able to have been brought together and for the spirit that was felt. And we say these things, Jesus Christ, amen. So the Disney wait times, like, that's awesome. Literally, but... I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if this is normal. Does anyone else do this? It's like daily. And I just want to know, like, okay, so, you know, Pirates is this long and Haunted is this long. So how do I, I don't know. That's not normal. 
That's funny. Oh my I God. I love it. Thank you guys there and get you on these rides so fast. You need to make a, a blog and like track it and get some graphs going on. So there we go. Maybe yeah. You use these talents. <laughs> I love it. I love Think it. Think about that. That's hilarious. That's a specialized skill. That is a very that specialized process. skill. Yes, Thank exactly. You. Thank you very much. Exactly. For <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I'm with you there on the travel stuff too. I I am checking travel stuff all the time. Cruise prices. Oh, there's like, there's like oh my crazy good deal. There was a couple years ago, my friend found a round trip ticket from Salt Lake, I think it was, for $157 to the Virgin Islands. Wow. That's what I'm okay. About. Okay, let's go. That yeah. one to North Bay was just I mean, over yeah. 200 barely straight from That's Phoenix crazy. to Norway. Oh my goodness. You gotta that go. I want to see the Northern Lights too. That's like Seriously. A okay. Do. Yeah. Do it. like, it's so amazing. I do it. Okay. We got it. But here we go. We'll we'll have a fireside trip. We'll all go check out the Perfect. North. I love it. Yeah. That'd mm -hmm. be so great. And and Lisa, you I understand we're in a movie with Wh William Shatner, but you never got to meet. We him. never met. Yes. I we did a mockumentary called Stalking Santa. You'll want to check it out. You can see it on YouTube. It's in, in its entirety. Okay. Starring my late husband um, as Lloyd Darrow, who is proving or disproving the existence of Santa Claus. And William Shatner is the narrator. It's really, really funny. It's become that is so classic. cool. So check it out. <laughs> how how did that how did, like how did you get William Shatner to narrate it? That's so um, cool. Lots of money. <laughs> hey, pay actors enough money, they'll do it. <laughs> one like that. The secret, the secret of life, <laughs> I, right I there. Like to think he was like, oh my gosh, who are this is an amazing performance. It's a it's a darling movie though. It's fun. So I like to think he loved okay. just the script, but. I love it. I also know what would make me narrate a movie. <laughs> now I've got a new movie. A big to watch. fat seen, check. Yeah, yeah. Once I, I was engaged it. one too many times. Well, you can never see it too many times. I'll pick another one. Listen, I'll entertain you all day long. I got the Lisa Show on BYU Radio, weekly podcast. We got Literally. show offs you can watch for free on the BYU TV app. I'll entertain you all. all this is awesome. <laughs> We'll have a party. Oh, People are I looking love it. for content. I'll bring it to you. Don't even worry. <laughs> for free. I love it. I love it. And and uh, Ashley, do you? I know you're not in St. George anymore, but do you get out hiking much or trail running type thing? You know like, what? Okay. Or? I am not a huge hiker. I've realized. Like I I love running. Like I love running because I feel like it's like the ultimate workout. Yeah. And like, I go to the, I go to F45, that's my gym and I, I love it, but I feel like running, it just, nothing gets you like running. And I just ran a half marathon with my husband in Hawaii a couple Whoa. weeks ago. Nice. He signed up to run this half marathon for my birthday and he hasn't ran since college. And he just goes in there and beats me. And I was just like, what? That's not fair. Oh <laughs> my God. I know. That's how they do I it. Know. You're, training. You're like, come on. I know. I know. So, but anyway, yeah, I like, yeah, not, not as much. I like the beautiful views, but not as much into hiking as I am running. Trail running is where it's at. That's, That's where awesome. It. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, y'all, thank you so much again for being here on the fireside. This has been so fun getting to know y'all better and hearing your stories and perspectives. And uh, just, you guys are, you guys are great. You're, you're fantastic. So thank you so much for, for being with us again. Thanks for having us. We'll close thank things you. to all of you who are watching wherever you are throughout the world. Thanks so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time for another fireside. Thanks so much, everybody.